So thank you very much. Uh, we are continuing uh, with the fourth panel. The fourth panel uh, is titled From Material Culture to Design. Designing to build uh, is one of the essence of architectural practice and for many offices, one of their obsessions. To build today opens new windows to the understanding of construction systems, the use of the materials and the fabrication of the components and instruments of a critical practice as a theoretical, political ingredient of the present. We have three practices for this panel. Thomas Chapman founded Local Studio in Johannesburg in 2011. His work explores a kind of local condition through the recuperation of the industrial legacy of the recent history of South Africa. Moreno Ramos and Eloisa Castellano come from Mindelo, Cape Verde. They work quite close to the processes of construction, blurring the boundaries between design and fabrication, always looking for a very sensitive relation with the people. And James Sen, as the founder and principal of People's Architectural uh, Architecture Office, based in Beijing, China, P-R-A-O, is the first big corporation in Asia that means work for the sustainable, useful for the community, and socially responsible guidelines. And they work with contemporary industrial resources from prefab to recycled construction system. It's a very active experimental way that has taken them to Venice Biennale or London Design Museum. The panel will be moderated by Eddie Bunge, who teaches here at GSAP, principal of N Architects, together with Mimi Hoang, also faculty of GSAP, and of his focus on the experimentation through construction with the architecture, uh, sorry, uh, through construction with the architectural culture and its pedagogy. After this panel, we'll have a coffee break before going to the last part of the evening, so thank you for your assistance. We have some more offices to show you. Um, I think uh, local studio is first. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I come from Johannesburg, South Africa. I established my practice local studio there in 2012. Um, when I started, we were two laptops in a living room doing self-built projects. And we've grown over the years to a team of 13 professionals, some, 12, some five years later, sorry. I'm only five years old. This is our own office building in Brixton, Johannesburg, which we developed and, worked from, and work from today. We offer architecture and urban design services and do a wide range of projects. Um, our building is a bit of a 3D business card for us in that it's a mixed-use building. There's retail on the ground floor, offices, our office in the middle, and, and apartments on top. It acts as a bit of a complex, uh, as a catalyst in a complex area. And interestingly, we've actually picked up a few clients who started off as patrons in the coffee shop downstairs. I can't claim that I'm in a position where I can pick and choose work, but one of the only constants in our work is that we try to emphasize the importance of public space and try to impact the public realm in all of our projects. This might seem obvious to this audience, but it is pretty unusual for those who know my city. I was invited to talk, to talk about practice within the sub-theme of material culture, because I believe that as a firm we're known to be experimental and innovative with materials. I think this conference is insightful, and I thank uh, Prof. Ferreros for the invitation. But the truth is I actually stress a lot more about cash flow than I do about materials. But I think the two are somewhat interlinked. Today, the majority of my work is conducted in Johannesburg, a city established 111 years ago due to the discovery of immense gold deposits, beginning where the center of our downtown is today. The mines and in turn the construction of our city relied heavily on cheap migrant labor, a trend that has sadly continued to this day due to an entrenched system of social engineering through spatial division known as apartheid. Although apartheid was officially abolished in 1994, its legacy lives on, not least in the way we plan our spaces and construct our buildings. 23 years after democracy, we have a situation where despite publicly opposing one another, the largely unchanged capitalist private market and the so-called revolutionary government contribute in their different ways to an industry that is dreadfully slow-moving, 
cripplingly aspirational and continuously obsessed with the creation of devices of separation. Jonah Ero, who actually lectured here at Columbia last month, once said that the largest prefabricated construction module that makes sense in South Africa is the brick. And I was thinking of calling my presentation Beyond the Brick in reference to my perhaps controversial view that the dominance of masonry construction in my country can be attributed at worst or at least associated with some of the problematic aspects of our industry and how I've grown my practice by purposefully not building in brick. The project that enabled me to launch a practice is the Outreach Foundation Community Centre. This is a multi-purpose centre built for an NGO in what is one of the toughest parts of downtown Johannesburg called Hillbrow. When we met the client, they had secured uh, about $200,000 through a national lottery grant and had appointed an architect, another architect, to design a small brick building to sit alongside an unfinished community hall. We were invited to pitch an alternative design and propose a translucent box floating above the odd unfinished building rather than beside it, creating more space for dance, more natural light and views of surrounding buildings. I most certainly bluffed when I said that they could get this building for the price of the old one and I desperately went about trying to find a ready-made steel structure in the Farmers Weekly that we could use. As a practitioner, I've always been interested in working smart rather than hard, trying to find quick fix solutions to problems, avoiding working from first principles. In my search for a ready-made shed, I encountered a host of, of suppliers selling something like prefab construction, cold rolled se sections pre-assembled as wall and roof panels. I believe that the light steel frame industry in South Africa boomed and faded within two years of this project, but for a moment in time we were able to build a building twice the size of the brick one for the same price and in a third of the time. It took four months to build. The building is now four years old and is heavily used and not looking too bad for its age. This project birthed a volley of social infrastructure projects built for clients wanting more and better spaces than what their budgets would allow and who were willing to deviate from our norms of construction that came to define the work of my office. I mentioned aspiration earlier. This is the construction site of the largest gated community in South Africa, known as Waterfall City. There are no waterfalls here, just brick walls, <laughs> dividing Mac Mansions from a no man's land of highways and power lines linking back to the Johannesburg city centre 20 kilometres away. It seems that the richer the rich have got, the heavier, uglier and further apart from each other they build their houses. And now this is not a problem in and of itself, but the brick bungalow has become the gold standard for housing in South Africa. <coughs> Enter the South African government and their reconstruction and development program called RDP, launched in 1994 with the RDP House, a $1,000 mini Mac mansion. And the government built just under 3 million of them for South Africans on the housing list. Even with the price tag, the government has not been able to provide even a tenth of the housing in the locations they are required due to this inefficient typology. The problem lies in that there's constantly a reference to the assumed aspiration of citizens. The people need proper brick houses with four walls and a roof which is an unattainable dream created by both, the government, both government and the private sector. About three years ago, we began working on adaptive reuse schemes in downtown, where developers had bought large former office buildings for very low prices, with the intention of converting them into affordable rental housing. Developers will often pick up these buildings for, for nothing and try to maximize efficiency. The affordability level of the housing market in South Africa is weighted at 70% with a household income of under $350 a month, forcing developers to build schemes that are accessible to this market. Projects like this mostly involve the creation of internal partitions to define, apart to define apartments within deep floor plates, which previously were open plan offices and industrial spaces. Now the cheapest way to do this would be with cement stock brick walls, and this is far more to do with the low cost of labor. Migrant workers are paid less than $10 a day than the cost of brick. Fortunately, the structural systems of most of these buildings cannot support heavy interior walling, forcing the introduction of innovative lightweight walling systems and an upskilling of workers in much friendlier working conditions. This project, called Bramfortain Gate, involved the creation of 400 affordable housing units in the burnt-out shell of an office tower built for the French oil company Total in 1976. The interior walls are rendered polystyrene, and the most interesting part of the intervention was actually the adjustment of the dark glass sunshades, which you'll see on the left, which actually obstructed the view of the city when you were standing up, and we turned these into balconies by cutting the steel frames and moving them up a meter. 
The glass was found to be brittle and we couldn't afford to replace it to the same spec, so we opted instead for white corrugated iron, which makes the change of use evident on the skyline. Amazingly, the 30-story building has some of the best views in all directions in Joburg and was built without balconies. We also converted the massive banking halls on the ground floor into communal spaces for tenants, something that makes the building a very popular place to live today, while being a massive departure from the traditional brick bungalow. The last theme I want to talk about is separation. Uh, the South African government has tried as hard as our corrupt president will allow to introduce large-scale public infrastructure projects that try to undo apartheid planning at the city scale. There are several bridges in planning and implementation stage intended to create pedestrian connectivity between areas purposefully separated by highway infrastructure. The most high profile of, the, of these is a new link between Alexander Township and Santon called the Great Walk. Alex is a very dense and poor black area of a million people and Santon the richest square mile in Africa and our Wall Street. There's generally very little material innovation in these projects, meaning that despite looking very heavy and imposing, they'll take five years to build and therefore be plagued with cost overruns and labor issues to the extent that by the time they're complete, the surrounding community have a very negative impression of them. This is actually the temporary footbridge built over the highway, which, was create, which created access while the Great Walk was being completed. This one was built in four weeks. We were given the opportunity to work on one of these projects, a pedestrian bridge at this location between two areas previously separated by apartheid. The level crossing had seen a lot of children knocked over, so there was an immediate practical need apart from the symbolic act. Needless to, needless to say, the initial concept prepared by the engineers looked a lot more like a wannabe color trava. We were able to wrestle design control from the engineers and proposed a lightweight steel bridge which was built off-site in two months and erected in 24 hours. With savings in the construction costs, we were able to build a community park on the western abutment, which is the poor of the two communities. We purposefully painted the bridge red as a reference to the efficiency of temporary scaffold bridges. And as a reminder that the ability to connect trumps the iconic object which symbolizes connection. I will end with a statement about practice. I believe that we've been somewhat successful as we've been during these first five years, precisely because I'm not a perfectionist. Our material language was birthed out of a need to produce quickly and efficiently, and has now developed a life of its own, which speaks about lightness, temporality, and with that, a symbol of a new formal future for a city held back by its heavy apartheid modernist past. I would call local studio a quasi-commercial practice, in that we're not the enemy of developers, but use our insight to find other ways of making their their projects profitable than the methods that seem obvious to them. Our moderator, Eric, actually said we sh we, we've got 10 minutes and not 15, so I'm actually done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Ramos Castellano will be next. Welcome. Hello to everybody. We need a small, short video for uh, introduce yourself uh, in Cap Verde.
Between there is a city in a small island that is San Vicente, that is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, 300 kilometers from, far from Senegal. And uh, this is... No. Okay. Sorry, okay. okay. This, is the, this is the second house that we built by ourselves for a, an American client. And uh, we made the project, we made the building <coughs> uh, construction, and, uh, and it takes us about three years. One year for the project and one e two years for the building construction. Uh, this, this was uh, a picture of the, the site where, uh, where we worked for two years. Uh, there, uh, meanwhile, Eloisa was working in the studio, was uh, carrying the, the employees, the worker in the, in the, in the site. And uh, this takes us two years to, to build it. So in that time, I had time to, to make paintings and uh, using the material construction. This is lime putty, for example, because uh, it was tiring to stay always concentrated in architecture and they, 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 they have a totally different logic in Cap Verde. So uh, it takes time to understand everything and uh, for uh, go out to the island, uh, we need some, uh, some some other uh, activity. And this was the activity that I developed uh, all the time in the, in the building construction. Then this is the, the house. The house was very introspective because the client want to be not in the middle of the social dimension, but in the middle of his dimension. So he want to enjoy the nature and, uh, and just the place. The house is uh, bioclimatic, is passive, uh, is passive uh, at level of uh, um, climatization, and uh, we try to use uh, more material that we find in the inside, uh, but not the, the wood. The wood come from uh, other place in Africa, but we will return in this uh, question of the material later in other project. The wood is remain all the time raw because uh, it was easier to let the material interact with the place, instead of uh, treating him and uh, every time, every two years, give manutention. So when we let, when we let the material like they are, we, we do that because we think about the trees. The trees don't need manutention, so we use wood like it is. This is another project. Um, this is our um, fifth project uh, realized in Cap Verde. Uh, this is in a small fisherman village called San Pedro, and we built this uh, this eco hotel named Achilles Eco Hotel, and this is a, a, an interesting story because uh, we were the we did the project and uh, we were also the clients, uh, we were partners in this uh, in this hotel. So um, <clears throat> many people uh, they think that that was uh, a crazy thing to do because it's a very small village, fisherman village, and uh, people say oh, you are crazy to do this in this place because no one, no tourist will come there. Um, but we were we were sure about this and. Um, we, we go ahead with, the, with our purpose and uh, we, we, we finished the project and uh, well, it's, uh, it's in, the middle, in the middle of the village and uh, because we, 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 we wanted to put, um, to put people coming from outside enjoying and this, uh, the, the, the real life of Cape Verde. Well, um, uh, I know that many of you, uh, maybe you, you don't know Cap Verde <laughs> because it's a very, very small country, um, 10 tiny islands. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, as Moreno said previously, it's, uh, we, we, we have this, this very peculiar logic. So, um, so well, uh, we, we, we built this here in the in São Pedro in the Fisherman Village, and as you see, is a is a, a concrete structure. 
with those the, the rooms we made the rooms uh, as uh, containers uh, the the dimension of uh, well you see Achilles is here this this photo was taken from the sea the ocean is in the middle of the the the, the, the village and uh, uh, I said that uh, we we used the the, the, the initial uh, idea was to to use containers, but then we, we change our minds and we, we decide to use certified wood and we built the, the rooms as, a, as a, well, the shape are containers and the dimensions. Um, and um, I will go ahead with, the, oops, with the, the photos. This is another view from the hotel is in the very middle of the of the village, as uh, I was saying uh, before, because we, we, we will uh, people to enjoy the real life. This is um, during the construction. You can see uh, the materials. I was talking uh, concrete structure with this, um, the, those uh, containers, let's say, uh, built as uh, panels, panels, panels assembled. And we, we, we made all the panels uh, in Mindelo, and then uh, they carry to San Pedro and um, to assemble the, all, the, all the, the work, as you can see here. Uh, and um, in this photo, uh, in this photo uh, the, the idea that it, this is in, uh, implicit here, is that uh, the flexibility that we want in our architecture because um, uh, life as, uh, as life and architecture change and uh, also tourism change. So uh, we, we, we made the project like this because uh, tomorrow, uh, if the conditions uh, change, we can change also. We can transform in a part, into apartments or uh, whatever. Um, this is uh, a photo uh, showing uh, uh, the, the, the local boats that people use to, to go fishing. And uh, we, we take, basically, we take the, 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 same, the same kind of, um, of way of building, uh, let's say, like this, uh, with these uh, boats. And uh, we used uh, this, the, the, the construction report uh, let's say that uh, this idea of the of the um, the, the boats uh, construction in wood with the the, the cords inside uh, for the the movement of the wood. Um, that one is another view of uh, of the of the hotel facing the 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 square and the school. Uh, here we are. We have the, the the rooms, very simple and natural. As uh, um, we want our, our architecture to be uh, natural for people, uh, because architecture without people is nothing. Uh, so we try to to give uh, most that, that simplicity is a, as a very difficult uh, thing to reach, and we try to. To, to create to our architecture simple, uh, simple and um, but not um, how to say uh, banal. Um, well, um, and the, the the rooms are simple because we want to en to encourage people to uh, discover the place, not to stay with the internet all time with the la the, their uh, smartphones or laptops. So we don't have internet. Uh, we don't have uh, there. We don't have internet. We don't have television. But it was uh, um, decisions and choices we made um, uh, in conscience, let's say, uh, because in uh, in um, in some ways uh, it's also a way to encourage people to discover themselves and. Um, do reflection and 
well enjoy a, a place because when you go uh, when you go visiting a, a foreign country uh, it's important that uh, maybe you interact with people and uh, and know the the environment and uh, well uh, this is another view from the Aquiles uh, Eco Hotel. Uh, as you can see, uh, life there has a very is a very slow, <laughs> it's a no no rush, and uh, people. Uh, well, it's it's a, it's a very poor uh, village. To people don't have uh, maybe. Uh, water in their um, uh, house, and they have to carry water. Um, but um, they, they, there's a lot of, of, of happiness there because uh, you can see uh, children playing, and uh, and well, this, we 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 try to to use materials, also this uh, kind of warm materials. To, to, um, to welcome people that uh, will uh, uh, stay in uh, Aquiles and uh, uh, from the inside of the hotel, uh, enjoy the village. This is uh, another project that we made, what we are making now <coughs> in uh, the island that is in front of San Vicente, one hour by boat. This is a agricultural island and uh, like you see in the picture, uh, we have old terraces in here, in the uh, persistent uh, uh, next nearest terrains. So the client of this project are German, and uh, they have a, a travel agency for uh, tracking tourism. So for them, it was interesting to keep the place like it is, and for us, it was possible to work with them because they don't want to destroy the place. So for them is to keep the place for earning money. For us, is to keep the place for let people live like they are used to live. And uh, our purpose was to spread their money in the village nearest of this place. And then, in this way, people can accept their project as well. And the tourists that comes there, they can feel the happiness that we spread in the people, giving them work for about two years now. The first phase of the project was the master plan. Then, after we have done the master plan, they start to build the, the terraces. And now, one year ago, we start to make the, uh, the architectural project. So we made an hotel of 14 rooms with a restaurant and a reception and 10 villas. Each villa is different and the, each villa has a, a different view. This is how they made the, the terraces. They take the stones from the valley that is uh, down this, this plot, let me say the, this big plot, and they carry it one by one, like they make pyramids without, uh, uh, without, yes, without machines and without instruments and making uh, these, uh, these, these, these terraces where they can really put agriculture. Uh, and then cultivate. So we try to make a circle in the project. Uh, the project is made for the people that come to visit that place, and then they can eat what they cultivate there. And then they can start to see how it works, how the people there lives with agriculture, with this uh, strict relation with the place. And, and then uh, this, is, uh, <coughs> this image show how this uh, architecture are uh, in the other part of the island and how we start to think our project. We want to transmit the same feeling that people that live there as when they live in their homes. So we want, this was very important for us and this is something that is a statement for us. We want to, the tourists don't change the place but the tourists change it by the place. So this was a statement. Our architecture, in a way, they are very political, but in a very simple way. We want to show what we understand and what we think that is uh, fair. And then we try to put them, people, in a very simple way, living in it. Uh, this is, these are the, the technical uh, issues that we had. And this is a tent where uh, I lived for about 15 days in different zone of the project for fill the site for uh, understand 
how the climate works there, where the winds come, where, which is the direction when it changes from the day to the night. Uh, and for example, sleeping there, I, I can experience eagles that make nests in the mountain uh, nearest, and then I can, know, I can understand that at night, the tourist can have that feeling. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the architecture comes very natural. Uh, it's a consequence of the process of uh, feeling the place. Okay. Uh, this project is uh, also an eco hotel uh, that we made in Mindelo in San Vicente for a French client. Uh, this guy is a, a, a trekking guide and he, he comes from the, the mountains in, uh, in uh, in France, and uh, well, uh, to, when he he came uh, into our studio, he has no he has an idea. He wants to build the the, the hotel, but he but we uh, we kind of uh, uh, build the construct the program um, with with him, and in this photo, you can see here is the Eco Hotel. Um, we we try to, as we we do in uh, in uh, every project, to um, to reach the integration uh, in the urban context. Um, Can I say something? Yes. We try to dance together with the other buildings. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Caverde is a very. Uh, we have dance everywhere, <laughs> music. <laughs> so. Um, well, uh, I was saying that uh, uh, I was talking about this integration in the in the urban context and uh, using the the same logic, as you can see, uh, of the of the built environment. We use the same logic, and uh, well, we we put our architecture there uh, as a mark, but integrated. <clears throat> Um, this is to, well, to, maybe I will show you this picture another time. Uh, there is, uh, this, this greenhouse existed. Uh, there's an ancient house, colonial house, and there's where, the, this is was the, um, the, the tracking office of this guy. And he has this piece of uh, land, this plot behind, and uh, there uh, is there where uh, we we build the, the eco hotel. Uh, well, we we can see here the, the ancient house. We made a few uh, changes there, not not really much. It's a, a bathroom and the, the terrace. Um, here we have the blocks, uh, the, the the rooms. Detach it from the from the the behind for the circulation of of people and also the circulation of air because we wanted this uh, this kind of uh, uh, cross the, the, we, we want we we, are, we want this cross ventilation in uh, every project uh, that we do and. Um, <laughs> Uh, here, uh, this is uh, technical drawings. Uh, this is uh, the 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 bar. Uh, it's an uh, above pilotis. To to um, to permit this uh, the fluid uh, the disentrance uh, the fluid of this uh, disentrance to permit the visitor to enter and to discover uh, the, the the surprise behind that uh, was the, the 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 blocks of the 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 rooms um, uh, here you can see uh, these oil barrels. Uh, because uh, and and this gate made by these oil barrels, barrels, because we want to always trying to reuse and recycle uh, uh, found materials um, in order to um, do this uh, sustainability. Um, 
So in this project, we recycled water um, and uh, we put solar, solar panels and uh, uh, in this uh, photo, you can see a room with these verandas, and we, we also um, design all the furniture, uh, beds and the lamps and everything. <coughs> uh, this is made by uh, recycled wood. Uh, here you can see uh, in this detail, uh, this, is wa this was a... Uh, the remains of uh, metallic profile that we cut to do the, the handle of the, of the, um, the doors. Uh, well, this is the, the, the lamp that we draw. Uh, this, well, this is a photo for the, the, of the construction and the view of the, and this is an overall view of the, 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 the bridge. Um, the, the, the rooms to the, the Dancian house. And this is uh, another project that we show in the next time. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a museum that is made by uh, the tamps of dead barrels. So it's a ventilated facade that permits the insulation of the, the building. And there is a, a small artisanal museum inside. Yes, I think I, I finished the time, so... <laughs> James, Sin, where are you? Where are you? Ah. <laughs> you move. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm very happy to be a part of this group. Let's see, uh, so I'm James, uh, representing People's Architecture Office. Uh, we are three partners. Uh, there's uh, me with He Zhe and Zhang Feng. Um, the both of them are uh, Chinese. They're from China. I'm I'm Chinese technically, but I'm originally from the U.S. And uh, born in Los Angeles, and uh, have been in China for uh, about ten years. Uh, so my my background: I have an undergraduate education in product design, and then I worked for a few years as a furniture designer, and then uh, went on to study architecture uh, uh, later on. Um, we do a wide range of uh, uh, scales and uh, and program in terms of projects. Um, but we, we try to always uh, ensure that we're engaging with uh, uh, social, social issues in our projects. Um, and part of our engagement with, uh, with uh, you know, social themes is uh, our interest in the informality. Uh, being based in Beijing, we find a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, the sort of creative ways that people uh, live there, I guess. Um, and uh, we started off with, you know, really no work and no money and, uh, you know, uh, had to come up with things to do. So we, we did this. We uh, um, tried to um, engage with this kind of informality in, uh, in, in our own way. Um, but this is also a reaction to the, the, the high cost of housing. Um, there is no private ownership of land in China. Uh, also, we are uh, playing around with materials. Uh, this is uh, polypro uh, poly uh, yeah, polypropylene uh, plastic that you can score and, and fold. Um, and we designed this space where you could uh, uh, have a, a temporary uh, bathroom, uh, kitchen, and, and, and bedroom. Um, we continue this exploration of material in uh, lots of different ways. We, we tend to have... Uh, we, t we tend to go to uh, ready-made things, uh, sort of found objects in, in a sense. Um, and again, adopting this kind of bricolage way of approaching uh, design. Um, so this material we thought was very interesting, the, these you know, reflective uh, uh, photography panels uh, that are both very flexible, uh, but also uh, st structural. So these, these structures are um, self-supporting. There's there's nothing else in there, and we literally pack these up, bring it to, uh, onto site, and and deploy them. Um, so this allows us this kind of modularity, collapsability. Um, th these are uh, 
uh, manufactured uh, in, in factories, uh, has allowed us to do this in um, many locations. Um, uh, and again, uh, looking at the way that uh, the city has developed and, and, and grown uh, in ways that uh, are unexpected, um, we've always found these for H HVAC uh, tubes on the outside. Um, interesting in that it, it shows you where there is program where uh, it, it wasn't meant to be originally. So say in, in the basement you have these uh, ventilation tubes that uh, lead you to, to the exterior. Um, and so we again, we, we used that, we adapted that to... Uh, to do quite a few things. Um, so this is signage. This spells out in Chinese, uh, um, which is the name of this uh, historic area in, in Beijing. And so this is a kind of a visitor center uh, to bring people to, to this area um, and to, to introduce them uh, to, uh, to this neighborhood. Um, so the, the tubes, they're not just the signage, but they are, they're also uh, uh, public uh, furniture. Um, and they're also uh, periscopes that you can look into. And then uh, what you see is, uh, well, there's one here where that allows you to see into the interiors uh, on the second floor uh, where they have uh, workshops going on. And then other ones over here and over here where you can see um, uh, views to important landmarks, historic landmarks in the area that uh, a lot of visitors, visitors may not uh, be familiar with. So the public furniture and the periscopes. Um, so this kind of uh, interaction with uh, people is something that's uh, central to our work. And uh, these, uh, these canopies are uh, also um, uh, interesting uh, along those lines. Uh, these are uh, collapsible sort of uh, uh, expandable canopies that take over uh, areas along the street at night when the cops are uh, not working. And they, you know, they have restaurants that basically like triple, quadruple their, their space. Uh, but these are some of the most active areas in the city. And so we were invited to do a uh, kind of a, an intervention in, uh, in, in the UK, actually. This is Preston. And so what we did is we took those canopies and uh, altered them and put wheels on them. So um, they were interested in connecting two areas in, in, this, in, in Preston. Um, and so we thought we would design these uh, uh, large sort of architectural scale um, uh, objects that you can the public can cycle from one place to another, and then where you stop, you can expand them out, uh, and they have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, public programs. And again, this because of this approach, this has allowed us to bring this to many different cities. Uh, so this has been in, um, and now it's been in more cities than this, but uh, uh, Leuven and uh, Hong Kong, also Shenzhen. Um, and I think this also uh, brings about an idea that, um, uh, that we like, which is uh, prototyping and testing out ideas. Each time we do this, we, we make it better uh, because there's, there's a lot of problems with this project. It's very, very difficult, um, it's scary at times because it's, it's quite large. Uh, and uh, something that's moving, uh, cycled by, by people who've never uh, done this before, it's, it's a risky thing. Uh, but it is a, a way for us to sort of develop a, a product that we see also as architecture that is also having a, uh, uh, a, a, a strong engagement with the city on, uh, on city scale. Um, the next project is the, uh, our courtyard house plugin, and I think this brings together a lot of the uh, ideas I've shown you before. Um, this project is based in an area uh, right in the center of Beijing. Um, this is called Dashalar. And uh, this is Tenement Square. This is the Forbidden City. And also, you can sort of see in the fabric that this is uh, uh, now not um, so common in, in Beijing anymore. And this, this is uh, these uh, historic Hutong neighborhoods uh, that Beijing is really uh, well known for. Um, and this is the largest remaining part of um, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, texture. Um, so in, in Dashalar, uh, you have uh, really uh, poor conditions there. It's really a slum-like environment. Uh, there's, there's no sewage. Uh, buildings are hundreds of years old. Um, and also, a lot of uh, properties have uh, become vacant because of these conditions. Uh, most of the population is, uh, is uh, elderly. Um, and so we proposed to the city uh, a way of uh, retrofitting, reusing this, these spaces without removing people or tearing anything down. Um, and the idea was to build uh, a house within a house. So uh, without changing anything of the original building, uh, we build a, a new building inside of that. Um, so you can see some uh, before and after images. 
there's uh, a lot of uh, informality going on here. Um, and uh, our way of doing this is with a uh, prefabricated uh, panel that we developed uh, on our own. Uh, in fact, it's a uh, kind of structural insulated panel. Uh, these are some images from the factory. Um, so these panels allow you to bring these in. They're, they're very light. You can carry them uh, with uh, actually a couple people. Um, and you can move them through uh, these small alleyways. And we have this, uh, what you call a cam lock that's integrated into these panels. Um, so this allows you to build a house in uh, just a few hours. Uh, it's extremely inexpensive, but uh, very high quality uh, because it is manufactured in, in a factory. And this is just me and my partner uh, building this house. Uh, this is actually our, our, our first one. <laughs> That's the neighbor looking at it. Uh, we can also uh, mold in uh, wiring. Uh, this is, uh, I should explain that this is all molded. It's uh, injected polyurethane. Uh, so that allows us to um, integrate all, all kinds of things. Uh, but the exterior interior finish, is, it's all uh, in the final panel. Um, so when it's finished, it, you're pretty, it's pretty much uh, ready for you to uh, occupy. So that lady that you saw that was kind of peeking over, really curious about what the hell we were doing, actually was really skeptical <laughs> about what we were doing. Uh, ended up uh, going in there and, and, and realizing, wow, it's really warm in the winter uh, and there are no heaters on. Um, she ended up being our first uh, uh, local to uh, ask for one of these. Um, I, I should also mention that this started off as a government pilot. So in fact, it was a, um, uh, it was a government project. Uh, which is significant for us because in many ways we're, we're criticizing the ways that uh, the, the government has been approaching uh, urban renewal. Um, but to have this uh, lady uh, ask us to do this is, is, is really important because it means that this is affordable for them. This is, it would cost about 30 times the amount uh, of, of money to, to, uh, to have a, a new house in this location. Um, this whole thing cost, the, her, her unit cost about uh, uh, 2,000 US dollars. Um, and we've, we've done also other uh, properties. That, these are the ones that are vacant, that are owned by the government. And, uh, we've turned them into uh, sort of Airbnb uh, type of uh, spaces. Uh, and, and we've continued doing this for uh, other homeowners. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we've also moved our office to this location. Uh, to bring us closer to uh, to our work, um, these are these are some uh, they're kind of like Lamborghini doors that open up, uh, but it allows us to uh, use this uh, courtyard space uh, more uh, uh, efficiently. This is uh, an interior of our office. Uh, we also design furniture. All these things are uh, designed by us, uh, and here you can see kind of the uh, relationship with the new and the old. Um, this is our first, this is called a plug-in house, it's our first uh, project that is independent of the uh, original structure. Um, so this is Miss Fan, and she just kind of came up to our office, we're almost like a shop front. People come up and say, hey, you know, can you uh, do a new, new, new bathroom for me or a new kitchen for me? Um, and we say, sure. Um, uh, so this project was interesting also in that its, its form is not dictated, not dictated by, uh, by uh, planning guidelines or policy, uh, because there is, there is none. It's not exactly legal to do this. Um, <laughs> so what we had to do was negotiate amongst the, the people around us. So the, this neighbor said, you know, don't block my light. This neighbor said, don't block my view. And this neighbor said, don't block my air. And so that's what the <laughs> final result is. And people will say, well, this, this doesn't really fit with the environment. You know, it, it, there's all this contrast. But I, and then I answer, well, you know, this is, this is not original. This is not, n none of that is original. Uh, and, and these really reflect the building uh, techniques of a certain period. And th these are built out of, uh, out of necessity, people challenging uh, the system. Uh, and, and we see ourselves as doing the, the same thing. Uh, so the, the lady, Miss Fan, she actually grew up in this neighborhood and uh, eventually left with her family as they uh, you know, were able to afford uh, an apartment in a high rise uh, outside of the city. Uh, but since then, she's uh, now married and uh, is, is pregnant, and, and that's when she came to us to ask if we could do this and so she could move back to this area. She was attracted to the, uh, the, the community there, the social network that she's still connected to. Um, 
but also it's much closer to her work. Uh, she's able to shave off uh, three hours from her, uh, no, I'm sorry, four, four hours from her commute. Um, the interior is uh, done in a way where we really try to expand the, 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 uh, the space given the, the small size. This is about 30 square meters uh, for the house. Uh, this house costs about 2,500 uh, US dollars uh, and also took uh, just a couple days to, to put together. Um, we have these uh, clear story windows to bring light further into the space. Um, and uh, yeah, we also integrated a composting toilet so she has her own uh, bathroom. Um, the final project I'll show is, uh, I think, a project that uh, even more so ties together all, all of these ideas. This is called the People's um, Station. It's our uh, most recent project. We just finished this uh, probably a couple months ago. Uh, so this is a cultural center, and it uh, takes this uh, same uh, uh, plug-in panel that we've been developing, this prefab system, uh, except it's a much larger scale. Um, and you can see this steel structure allows us to uh, adjust the, the, the shape of the, the building. We can, exp we can add space, we can take away space. Um, and that kind of flexibility, I think, is, is quite important in the context of uh, China where um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, insecurity with the situation. Um, but we also integrated a lot of uh, our, our vehicles. So we uh, updated our tricycle house, uh, and that tricycle house is also attached to the building, but also is something that you can cycle away. Uh, we also attached our uh, people's canopy. And so the, the ground floor of this building is all opened up uh, to the public. Um, this is, this is uh, situated on the border of a historic area and a... Uh, and the central business district, so it, it's really meant to be kind of a, like an entryway into this uh, historic area. Um, so it was important that we uh, designed a space that was uh, uh, engaging uh, to the public. And so this is the people's canopy that's being cycled away. Uh, uh, and these are the, the tricycle houses that, that have a mini people's canopy in the back. Um, and uh, also we have our, uh, our first kind of retrospective exhibition uh, as the inaugural event. This is uh, showing seven years of our work. Uh, you can see a small section of our, our plug-in panels, um, our, our uh, courthouse plug-in here, um, and a lot of uh, our other sort of installation type, inter intervention type projects in full scale. And as well as some of the interior we have, we have these uh, big, uh, uh, again, clear story uh, spaces to bring light inside. And I think that uh, concludes my talk. Okay, well, thank you all for this uh, set of very interesting conversations. Um, I was thinking about all the words that we've heard uh, today and those that we haven't a little bit. Um, a recurring refrain that uh, I think unifies a lot of the topics today is no work, no money, uh, <laughs> no time especially in the last one. And there are other words that we, we hear less. Uh, client, we've heard this word in a couple of the presentations, but one could also think of the kind of space to create the agency of you know, the practice as the sort of the more uh, predominant topic. Um, so maybe this panel is not so much about materials and designing and building uh, as it is about agency of the architect through that, through that logic. Um, so, um, I would, I would like to kind of summarize some of the things that I think you, you guys share and some things that you, that you don't um, in, in three categories. One is actors, who you are. The second one, uh, culture and context. And the third one could say is the, the practice itself. Um, so first of all, uh, you all come from kind of obviously very different backgrounds, but in fact, some of you are practicing in countries other than your own, um, whether you're you know, American Chinese or Italian working in Okay, Verde, um, and of course you have a multicultural practice as well. Um, you all say, well, two of your offices in your website say we are young, um, and I think you're probably all young, but it's something that is part of a mission statement. Um, all of you are humanists at, at heart, and I think you all talk about uh, people, um, whether it's uh, you know, the users or the misusers or the empowerment of labor uh, through handicraft um, or the, you know, the emphasis on public space and, and the activation of public space, right? Now, in terms of the culture, cultural context, I looked this up in Wikipedia. Um, the uh, GDP per capita of uh, Cape Verde is about $4,000 a year. Um, in Beijing, it's $15,000. 
and in Johannesburg is $19,000. So we have actually kind of a disparate set of uh, GDPs per capita. But this doesn't really describe the cultural context you're working within because you know, you're working in a massive city and you're working in a very tiny island and you're working in a relatively large city. So we have very, three very different um, cultural contexts in, you know, in that sense. Um, in terms of the culture of construction, uh, you know, I think speed, labor, uh, skill has come up uh, qu quite a bit. Um, and I think another thing in terms of the cultural context are the social divides that are maybe quite different in, in each of your cases. On the one hand, you know, we have the kind of divide of Cape, Cape Verde being kind of on its own, divided from everything else, pretty much. It's kind of an island in, uh, to which most materials arrived in oil bar or in barrels and, and so on. So there's a kind of culture of scarcity. Um, to the apartheid uh, state, which still in some ways has an, an enormous legacy, um, to the divide between the Hutongs and the, and the New Beijing. So one could say that you're all trying to somehow bridge some of these massive divides. Um, in terms of practice, some things that I notice that you share or, or don't share, because it's a very heterogeneous group at some level, um, is the kind of interest in the, uh, well, blurring the boundaries, as Juan put it quite clearly, uh, between, I, I would say, drawing and building. Quite, quite simply, the insertion of the architect within this kind of, uh, you know, uh, space of construction. Um, maybe an interest in the informal, one could say, or the inform, uh, even. Um, and then I would say the active interventions that all, the, all three practices seem to, uh, you know, partake in as a way to create, you know, construct a practice. Um, and maybe one more thing that you share as uh, you know, practitioners is an intimate an incredible intimacy in terms of your relationship to your users. I mean, you know the names of not just your clients, but the neighbors. Um, you know, you, you, you speak a lot about the, you know, sleeping in the site. Um, Moreno, you talked about like how you camp in the site and you get to know the workers, you work with them, you're, you're actually building the projects. And then um, I know, Tom, you guys have a community relations person on your team and you, it's very, very important how you, you, know, you engage with that, with that context. So, I guess three topics that I think govern maybe our, our, our discussion we could structure it this way. One is uh, we can think about culture and context. Um, second one, think about performance of materials and design build, but in the sense not so much technical, in terms of theatricality sometimes of this, this performance. And then finally, let's, let's end up talking about more specifically about, you know, about practice. So um, I guess my first question is, um, maybe starting with you, James, can you be specific about a challenge that you, your office has faced that you think uh, you know, produced, in a sense, the constraints of the project in, in, in a very kind of in a, you know, uh, in innovative way, where invention arises from, from these challenges? A, a challenge? Or? Just name, name you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think working in China is very challenging. Uh, I, I think previously, uh, uh, O-Office mentioned um, it's, it is possible to very easily have a, 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 a well-functioning practice. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting work and producing, but uh, to have work that embodies certain ideals that you have, I think is extremely difficult. Um, such as the, our, our project in the, the Hutongs, um, we, we wanted to be critical, right? We, we wanted to in, ensure that we have a critical practice. Um, and you know, we started off being idealists, um, and, but you still need to have a space to, to be active. I mean, we, we also, uh, we, we never show any um, renderings of anything. We, on our website, we, we try to only show built projects. And when you do that, when you give yourself that kind of constraint, you, you're, you're building very, very small things. Yeah. Um, but uh, we wanted to ensure we had that active engagement, this sort of physical material engagement, and also to be able to try things out and test things out. So a lot of those projects could not be done. It would be impossible to preconceive them. Uh, and in a way, one could say they would be impossible without the enormous constraints that you, that you face, because you'd be yeah. building villas for uh, someone else. Or. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think it, architects have um, just, for whatever reason, we've become fairly uh, alienated from uh, a lot of the work that uh, we understood the, the profession to be. Mm -hmm. um, it, I do have a strong interest in uh, finding a way to have greater social agency. Um, that's part of uh, uh, yeah, this uh, B Corp uh, certification. Uh, I think also uh, from other people here, uh, architects are becoming more entrepreneurial, uh, mm -hmm. and that is something that we're looking into. Also, uh, interested in different ways of uh, scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thinking back to my product design background, uh, products are smaller, uh, but they have immense scale. 
uh, and they, are, they can also have uh, immense uh, impact. I think what, one of the things that characterizes that your different approaches is in fact this multidisciplinary background. You, you, ha you have a product background, uh, um, you're also an artist, um, and I, again, I mentioned community relations. I'm not sure if this, you have the same kind of uh, heterogeneity in the office, but there's certainly the, you know, the approach uh, has to do with this. In terms of culture context, uh, cultural context, one, one thing that keeps on coming up is speed. So you guys build really quickly. I don't know how long, things go really slowly in, in Cape Verde, so maybe this is a little different. But I, I know in Johannesburg, you, you mentioned that uh, you know, speed is an absolutely cr critical issue, but as is skilled labor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we've uh, maybe developed a bit of an edge because we've shown that it can be done quickly. Um, I think we've, we've got a real departure. I mean, if you look at this, the zeitgeist, uh, young, even young firms in, in Johannesburg now, it's still very much an uh, obsession with um, permanence, with making monuments, with this kind of, which I think is a, I, I think of it as a modernist idea. And with us, is, um, we're not as concerned about the buildings lasting forever, interestingly. It's, uh, it's a very immediate need, and we think uh, they've got a role. The sooner we can get them up, they've got a role to play for a, for a fixed amount of time. And then, you know, we don't, it's not to say that, they, that they're uh, temporary, but, uh, but they're not burdened in the same way. So once we, we set ourselves those constraints, um, or l lack of constraints, I think we we kind of then come upon some really interesting solutions. And that's why we, I mean, we're obsessed with things like scaffold and, and finding ways to apply that sort of idea. Which yeah. is uh, something that kind of unites yeah. the work of all three, yeah. I would say. But the empowerment yeah. of, of labor yeah. seems to have okay. come up in, in all of your discussions. Yeah. The, the, for, for Moreno and Eloisa, mm. I think the idea of uh, engaging as many people as possible, spreading the mm. wealth. I mean, I love how you put it, Moreno. is like, we took the client's budget and we tried to spread it among the, on, on the mm. site, or spread it amongst the community. Um, and I th I've read interviews where you've talked a lot about how you try to uh, you know, use as much handicraft as possible. So can you speak a little bit about this cultural context of labor, you know, the lack of skill, but also the empowerment of labor and the, the training mm. of labor through your projects? Um, well, um, as you, <laughs> Eric, uh, said, uh, life in Cape Verde is uh, very slow, and but uh, sometimes can, it could be stressful for us architects because we have schedules and uh, the, the work to do. Um, but all these things in a, in a certain way, um, um, how to say, uh, lead us to, to, to have this, uh, this relationship with materials and with culture. Uh, and with the workers too, mm -hmm. because uh, you have uh, s sometimes you have to to understand them, and you have to 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 go and maybe if they they don't understand the, the, what you are saying, you have to draw, you have to maybe uh, make build, a mock up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or try to build uh, or made, made a prototype or uh, this kind of uh, of approach. Um, so the, the walls in this, uh, um, this last in project the, the you project, showed, yes. that you described them in another conversation we had as being similar to those of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin. Yes. So is, this is not an indigenous practice, right? It's, it's taking it to the typical stone wall but then transforming it by creating formwork and pouring concrete. Is that correct? Yes, because in a way we want to be contemporary. So we are not making typical houses, mm -hmm. but we want to just transmit the same feeling with different uh, form of work, with different, uh, we are in a different time. So what we are uh, trying to show is the same feeling, but in a different way. So that, that brings me to a kind of general question. I don't know who wants to take it, but you all have a kind of varying level of sentimentality or unsentimentality about history and about um, materials at some level. I, um, I would say maybe, uh, t you know, Tom and James probably are less sentimental, maybe kind of you, the way you talk about materials purely in terms of speed um, and, and, you know, budget. Um, you guys, you know, you, you talked about this factory. I mean, it, maybe the way you talked about the Hutong context. Well, it's just one other layer of history. So you're all working within these stratified historical contexts, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is your position uh, relative to the contemporary? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. Um, 
I mean, I mentioned it, it, it ties into what I was saying just now. I think the we start we 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 start off being pragmatic, and I think that's the and then it ends up actually representing a, a new a new direction or a new future. So, and now it's become a bit of a it's just something we we actually we we struggle to do to build in media that do, that doesn't really contrast from 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 its surroundings. So we've become known for that. So contrast, I mean, yeah, contrast. But I would say it's not. It's not. I mean, it's not. Sent, not it's not that we're sentimental, but we actually definitely. It's now become something that we we try to emphasize. Um, I don't know those of you know Johannesburg, but it was built at, at a time. The majority of the city was built at a time where Max Gold production, which is the mid 70s. So you've got. Uh, we actually had Skidmore, Owings and Merrill build a tower in our. <laughs> yeah, big deal. <laughs> for for New York, but. Uh, you know, and it's got this, this grayness and this, 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 this heaviness. And I think, uh, you know, that building, the first building I showed was the first, the first piece of social infrastructure to be built in downtown Johannesburg since the, it's pretty much that time, the mid 1970s. Mm -hmm. So uh, we couldn't afford to build like they built because, you know, we just we we were in a we we're in an economy with a negative growth rate. So you can't possibly try to mimic uh, what's 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 there or even borrow from what's there because it just costs too much. So, and, and in fact, I think it, you know, all yeah. of you work in a way yeah. with both local and imported traditions Correct, or yeah. materials, whether yeah. the wood comes from Norway or mm -hmm. um, you know Africa, mm -hmm. or but then you know very local construction techniques. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in James's case, you know, working within a of course a city that has a vast manufacturing uh, um, potential, especially when you have a product design kind of uh, you know background, uh, working with that, the, the possibilities seem endless to, to me. That you can build a house for two thousand mm dollars, -hmm. <laughs> you could probably build a toilet. For two thousand dollars in New York, mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, on union labor or something. Um, Not if it's made in China. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, this question, in a sense of uh, you know regionalism, if you will, we're in a kind of a, a almost post-regionalist uh, kind of era. Perhaps you're you're unsentimental about where things come from. And you want to empower workers, but so you're working within very opportunistically, one could say, inserting yourself as architects within production cycles, but also within sites. Um, it, do you think this is something your generation shares? Uh, is, there, is there something new in the air in this kind of empowerment of the architect and, the, and, and labor? Well, I think to be contemporary is to understand these, these forces. Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't think we have any choice, right? Uh, I mean, everything around you is mass produced, uh, except for buildings. Um, and so that, that is why we have this interest in, in understanding manufacturing's role in, uh, in architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our loss of agency has to do with that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we, we're not familiar with a lot of these uh, technologies. Um, and there's a barrier for us to engage with, with this, and so we, we want to explore that. Um, I agree very much about uh, materials. It's, it's, I, I think we, our interest, our sole inter our, um, our main interest, I would say, is cultural. Uh, but in, or, in order to get to the cultural, uh, we think the, the way to do that is to be ultra pragmatic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, that kind of uh, exaggerated uh, pragmatism is what you see in uh, these, uh, in, in this uh, sort of uh, urban inf uh, informality. So no one's spoken about materials in reverential terms. There's no sense of kind of the iconic, mm. yes. you know, the precious, uh, the kind of, any kind of meaning. <laughs> is what in, in our works, we use material like words. <laughs> so we, when we make a building, we want to make a phrase, no? And each material transmits a new word or, or a sensation. We use wood when we want to transmit nature. We use stone when we want to transmit nature. We use uh, handcrafted material when we want to transmit human labor. So sweat. Mm -hmm. So material are just a, a tool for transmit sensation. And the end of this sensation is harmony that we want to transmit. We want people inside our place feeling good. So I wonder if this is where the panel has a different approaches. Mm. Um, in a sense, what I'm hearing from your colleagues is more a sense of expediency. But maybe they're not telling the truth. Right? Maybe <laughs> that there's something behind this white, beautiful, crystalline, contrasting, you know, like house that immediately pops up like a mushroom in the Hutong mm -hmm. or the red, you know, bridge in, Hut in Johannesburg. I mean, you speak in terms that kind of divest the kind of emotional aspect of, of mm -hmm. these materials, but are you lying? <laughs> <laughs> well, m material doesn't come with associations mm -hmm. without the, the people that give them the associations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I mean, in fact, I don't think there is any contradiction. It's just a, 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 it's, a it's an issue with history. Mm -hmm. 
So in the Hutongs, yes, the, these buildings, they have absorbed uh, a very traumatic and tumultuous history. Uh, that's why there could be value in that, but only if there are people there to learn from it and understand it. Uh, if, if there are no people there, that it's, it's, you know, our, uh, our attitude is it's, it's useless. Uh, so we, we are also really interested in uh, flexible systems and flexible designs that allow people to engage with it, you know, engage with our design uh, in, in meaningful ways. And therefore, the opportunity for history to be absorbed into uh, certain materials, whether or not they're newer or older. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you said something interesting. I, I think that is uh, that we are experiencing a, a, a change of paradigm and paradigm now, change. Yeah, mm -hmm. and now uh, this generation, I think that they are changing the mentality and the approach, and this reflects in architecture mm -hmm. and in everything as, as life. Mm -hmm. In an interview I read about uh, with you, Eloisa, you mentioned that sometimes you or maybe you mentioned this the other day, that even just to choose one screw on your island is an incredible challenge because there's just no, there's no materials. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing. A, you have uh, oil barrels. Like a that, scarcity yeah. of material, incredible mm -hmm. scarcity of material. And as we talked two days ago, uh, sometimes you have to, to do this research on the, our market mm -hmm. before start to, before you do the project. to build. Yeah, I, that's interesting. So you said, Louisa, you have to check the market, yeah, see what's yeah, available yeah, before. Definitely. Whereas because we just design something and then we look it up, or we, we you know, command. And this, this, for, this forced us to start to design our, uh, our furniture too. Oh, okay. I, I would like to say that uh, we are essential, not like Miss Van der Rohe. We are essential because it's the only way to be. So we are forced to be essential. So the scarcity has produced a mode of practice. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a fashion, but it's a okay. state of living, you know? It's yeah, a that, kind of kind survival. Of survive. <laughs> let's, end <with> a, <laughs> let's end with just a couple of uh, questions about practice. And um, a question for you, Tom. You're seven years, no, five years into your practice. Mm. You, you, guys, you, guys, you guys are five years into your practice? Seven. Seven? Oh, no. 14. So you're old. About. <laughs> Maybe that's why yeah, you don't say we are young on your website. This is uh, from 2007 <laughs> okay. with Ramos Castellano. All right. 10 years now. So a question to each of you. Um, what is different about practice now than you ever imagined when you were a student? I mean, I've, I've got to say that I was, a, I was never a good student. I think throughout, uh, throughout university, I doubted whether I was, would be able to, to do architecture. And with that, I think throughout my, my studies tried to just find some sort of satisfaction making things or you know, running little hustles. No, but what's different? Hey? You, you, you're, you, you know, like the way you built the outreach project. Yeah, what's different about you, art? Yeah. You, you basically told them you can build it for a budget. You had no idea you could, you could do that. It was a complete gamble, right? Like, did you ever imagine that you'd be inserting yourself into that kind of space of risk? Like, yeah, I think I'm a, I think I'm a risk uh, sort of Prone person, I, 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 I don't mind risk. I think. What about you, James? Yeah. What's different? You're clearly, apart from product design to architecture mm -hmm. to now building two thousand dollar homes in Hutongs. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think one difference in terms of mindset is that we can actually uh, affect uh, policy. Uh, that our that designers can engage in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I, you know, I went through school thinking that. There are certain parameters we just have to accept. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't even do this intentionally. It just sort of, uh, you, you would have government officials coming to us and say, hey, we have these problems we don't know how to deal with. There's just so much, uh, there's enough social pressure that it, it makes this, uh, makes this a, a, a moment of crisis. And they need creative mm -hmm. minds to come up with. Uh, so none of you are waiting for the phone to ring, basically. Oh, oh no, I'm definitely waiting for the <laughs> phone to ring. But wh while I'm waiting, I'm making, uh, I'm making things. Yeah. And what about yeah. you, Moreno? What's different when you trained? Yeah, I can, I can Do you imagine you'd be sleeping on your sides all the time? <laughs> I, I, I wonder about that. But there is something that is interesting about architecture, that nobody can say you how to do that. So nobody can say how do you can be an architect, you know, what you have to do like an architect. There are different kinds of architects. So you're telling everybody here that whatever you're learning in school is not going to be like this. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, All and right. the point is uh, uh, have no expectation and be mm. open That's always right. and uh, try to adapt. Oh, well, that will take some questions from the crowd. There's one r right here, I believe, in the middle. Is there time? One question. Uh, 
So I was uh, really surprised when we first started that the panel on material and construction was going to be the first one that was about culture and justice, and especially with starting off with apartheid. I mean, it, it woke me up because I was falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then by the time you got to the, the end and the whole story of architecture as making an ethnic domain, whether you're resisting it as in the first one or preserving it as in the second one, using the empowerment of labor as a strategy, uh, I thought, you know, this makes sense. Because if you think about the, um, the grand challenges of the 21st century, it's all about material resources and cultural differences and how we're going to somehow live on a planet with an expanding population and disappearing resources. So you've, you're exactly at the epicenter of the grand challenges of the 21st century. And so you've been claiming to be young, but I want you, I want to ask you to, to pretend to be older and what you would aspire in your approach to contribute to these grand challenges as you look into the future. That'll be the next uh, constructing practice panel in, a, in a, <laughs> the next year when they get older. But I, it's a great comment, maybe not so much a question, but I thank you all for, uh, for coming and we'll, we'll think about your question for a long time. Thank you. Thank you.